So Roger, it's time to get this hip in now. Now this hip is exactly the same as any other hip, whether it's six meters long or a meter long. So what I'm gonna show you is a way called, we do it called direct measurement. So I can also do this by calculation, but generally speaking, it never ever works because we're talking about a difference of a few millimeters or a very, very small percentage. If for example, the plates are out of parallel or one also is, is out of level to the other, which is sometimes the case. First thing we do with a hip, we cut the corner of the wall plate off at 45 degrees because this is a 90 degree corner. First of all, I'll mark a line from corner to corner across the plates. And then just to make it simple, if you put a, if you put a center line down your timber, and then you're just gonna mark the sides, boom, boom. We're gonna transfer that over with a speed square. Okay, so we'll just mark that off. Let's get my square the right way around. Oh, we have to do, we actually have to do it like this. Let me, let me just join those lines up. Take that off. And then what we need to do also is because the plumb cut on the hip is gonna knock down into those blocks, you can do a little bit of ads work with the back of your saw, enough for a hip. All right, sight that through, perfect. Obviously it's a concrete block, you're gonna to have to get your angle grinder out. But there we have it. The next thing we do, using the same offcut of timber, mark a shoulder on the two last rafters. So these are the end common rafters. Same again, you're just gonna run that in there and you're gonna run a mark there and you're gonna run a mark there. That's effectively where the top edge of the hip needs to be. It needs to be in line with, not up, so you don't join the center to there. You take the edges with the edges. So when you're battening through, you come directly onto the side of the hip and you get a fixing all the way up. Now I always use a two inch timber, even though sometimes the drawings will say something like 38 millimeter. First of all, when I go to the timber merchant and ask for 38 millimeter, they don't stock it, but they'll rip it out of a two inch piece and they'll charge you the same money or more because they've had to cut it. So forget that. If you've got a drawing and it's asking you for a sort of a 175 by 38, Forget it, use a 175 by 50. It's actually betterment. You're gonna get a better fixing for your battens and it's a bit stiffer and stronger. And anyone who uses 38 mil stuff, it's really flappy and planky. And when you're using up a hip, you want it to stay nice and stiff. This is small enough, this roof, for me to actually measure this on my own. If this was a lot bigger and we've got our end commons way up there, it's a two man job and you're gonna need a tape measure, which is nice and stiff. Someone's going to hold it at the top because you don't want to get too much sag in that tape measure. So all I'm going to do is hook it on the corner here and measure up to the shoulder. So we hook it on here, measure up to the shoulder. 1657. Write that down and that's it for now. I've got a nice straight piece of 175 by 50 here. So the rafter we're using here is 150 by 50. So the hip needs to be taller because the, when you come in with a common rafter, the height of the plumb cut is longer because it's naturally steeper. A hip is always shallower because it travels to the same rise, but it travels a further amount because you're going at 45 degrees. So I've got my roofing square here set at the roof pitch, which in this case was 35 degrees. Now, as I spoke about this before, this is basically a protractor and it has a center, which in our case is right here. And in, our, in this particular square says CR run. That means common rafter run. So if you could imagine this being a protractor and, a big, and, and striking a big semicircle around that center, all the way up the square, there are degrees of pitch. And where you line that up with that point will give you the correct degree of pitch. When we come to do a hip, we've got something that says HV run, which means hip valley run. That effectively is the same as a protractor, 
but this distance between these two points allows for that extra run. It allows for the fact that you're traveling at 45 degrees. So you'll use HV run, but you'll still be using the same degree of pitch that you did for the roof. So in our case, it's 35. So I slide my fence over, set that up to 35 on the HV run. So the first thing I'm going to do is set out the foot of the rafter. And all I need to do that is start by putting my bottom cut or my seat cut. This forms the support for the soffit. It's the same as what we've got on the roof rafter. I'm going to draw that all the way through. Now I've got a measurement. So yesterday I worked out with the drop. So from the top of the wall plate to the underside of the soffit. In our case that comes into the heads of the frames. And we've got 280 millimetres. So I can use the stepping off method which is run against my line, come up the square, 200 here, and then another 80, 280. Now that is the wall plate level there. Okay, so I'm gonna mark a line through there. The next thing I need to do is mark the step back for the back of the bird's mouth. So on the actual rafter itself, we're using two thirds and a third. So two thirds of the thickness of the rafter above the outside of the corner of the wall plate and a third below. So what we've got with the rafter, here's one from yesterday. This is a, this is a very small end of a foot. So it's this distance here, but you don't measure it at 90 degrees. If you measure it at 90 degrees, it's actually slight, slightly shorter. You so is that the HAP, the height above plate? This would be the height above plate, yeah. That's quite a nice um, way of looking at it. So what I'm going to do quickly is just transfer this line through here. So I'm only going parallel with that. I'm going to transfer this all the way down there, the margin. And I'm going to measure that diagonal there. It's 126. So that's the line I want to be coming down. So I'm just going to mark a, a line here faintly, a line there faintly. I'm going to come down there 126. That gives me 60 mil. So that is the right distance from the corner of the wall plate. That gives me the corner of the wall plate. And away we go. So that is the bird's mouth that I'll be going for the hip. So the next step is mark the length. So when I cut the corner of the wall plate off, that represents the side of the wall plate. So where the wall plate is a corner, like this, and I've taken off half the thickness, oh, sorry, the full thickness of the hip here, I'm actually measuring to that point there. So that side is exactly there. So I've got my section of timber with my measurement on it, 1657. Now that is actually taken from where we measured it on the corner of the plate. So I'm going to measure the measurement which is 1657 from the corner of the plate to the top edge of this rafter. So it's only short, I can lay my tape out, I can use the weight of the tape to hold it, lock it off, 1657, there we have it, 1657, we'll mark the top now that's where I'm going to be putting my cut. So, it's a plumb cut. There's the picture of our hip. There's the plate, that's how it sits on the plate, that's level, that's plumb. So it's a plumb cut, so I sit that on there. This is the rafter. Run it up and then I'll mark that over there. Then, I'm going to transfer that to the other side as well. So, we are going to square that across. I'm going to mark the back side too, because I cut this from both sides. See, one of the only rafters I will cut from both sides. It's exactly that. I'll break this off first. Is that a saw you've got there? Is that a, a this, dual voltage one? Yep, this is a dual volt. So I've only got a um, five amp power or a two and a half amp power. So it's five amp power at 18 yeah. and it's two and a half obviously at 36. Right. And this is a brushless saw. 
really light. It's 4.3 kilos. Have you got enough guts to do a job like this? Do you know what? I've been breaking out. This is quite uh, wet, this timber. It was stacked outside, a lot of rain last week. It's drying out pretty rapid. But, um, and also it's very cuppy as well. See the cup in it? Yeah. It's really cuppy. So what you find when you're running through with a circular saw, if you follow the carp, as you're coming out the other side, it sometimes binds. So you might hear it sounding a little bit But actually, after you use the circular saw over and over again, and you can see a cup, sometimes you actually just know in intuitively to glide across the top of that, if you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because you can feel it. So um, I think it's just practice, really. So we'll break this out. We're just gonna break this bit of stock off the end here. Let's give myself another block underneath. You'll see it probably bind up here because, as I say, it's really, really quite wet, this gear. So he's going to take a lump off of here. OK, put that out of the way. Also, that plays havoc. That cup plays havoc when you're putting the 45 on as well. But I've particularly chosen this piece of wood because it has got a cup in it, because nothing's ever perfect. When I get on site, I've just got to deal with the timber I get. I can't just go, so, oh, this is no good for me. You just got to get over it, you just got to deal with it. So it's a beautiful cut. It's really, obviously it's got a very new blade, thin blade. You wouldn't want a fat one in there. So then we just finish that off with a handsaw. That's the bricklayer's one, that one. It's got no, it's got no teeth, it's like a snake. So we knock that out, just run that out. Perfect. Now we're going to cut the end. So, bear in mind I have got this bit of cup on this timber. I'm going to put my first cut through the, um, the bowie side because it will bind less. And then when I cut through the cupping side, it'll be easier for the saw to deal with it. What I'll do is I'll cut through, I'll set the depth so I just only take out what I need to take out. It's got a really quite a positive stop at 45, this saw. First thing I did when I picked it out was obviously use my speed square to check everything was um, true and it was fine. So then obviously we'll just adjust the depth. We'll bring that in to about just over halfway. I'll sit that in there. There we go. That's nice. Cool. So we're going to cut that. And the other thing actually about cutting it less than the, um, the full width, you could actually lay the timber flat, can't you? Because you're not going to cut through into anything underneath. So it's nicely supported and you can just slide through there nicely. So we'll do that now. So you heard that then when I was going through there because I was riding the cup, I was going over the top of the hill and it just started getting a bit unhappy, but it's all right. I mean, this is soaking wet. This weighs twice as much as it should, this bit of wood as well. So now we repeat the process on the other side. One thing this particular saw has got is amazing access to see the blade. So when I'm standing here, 
and I'm cutting this cut. I'm looking directly down. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. I'm looking straight down. My body's nice and straight. So where's the axis? So look at the space around the blade. It's amazing. And some years ago, I met with, um, before High Koki was, it was called Hitachi, obviously. And I met with some of the engineers who designed the tools um, and they were revamping the C9U, which is the nine inch corded circular saw, which has been a workhorse for me for many, many, many years. And we discussed about how I use the saw and the fact that I never really use the guides at the front. They're okay for just roughing out and doing some rough work, but actually I like to see the blade. And they took that into consideration. And when they then bought out what they called the C9U2, they'd made some changes to the saw based around our discussions, which I thought was particularly valuable. And then they went on to develop the next one, which is the C9U3, and they made a few more modifications as well, including a longer, a longer cable. But that's all by the by now, because I really want to get away from cables. I love the fact I can just pick this up, wander off, cut both ends of those timbers, whether it's five meters long, and it's, I'm 49, and, and my biceps just aren't like they used to be. I used to be able to pick my six kilo C9U up and just bash it out, but mate, my chest and everything. So here we go, get this one done. So there we have the, the cut, what it looks like. And this is the end of the hip. I'll just offer that up to you so you can see it. There we go. Imagine it up going up in the roof and it fits against your last two rafters here. All right. Right, let's give this a go. See if we need any little fashioning in. Pretty pleased with that. Sighting it through, always love sighting it through. Oh, how lovely is that? Oh, happy days. This is the dodgy side because there's a break in the plate. But you can see that there. Can't bend one of these, this is a Stabila. This is the daddy of all levels. A Type R, I'm sure that's what the, I forget what he kept saying, Type R. There you go, look at that. We can put it back on. Then the next nail, the nail at the top, acts like a, a, a wedge or a, how can I put it, like a pin. So I always go at 90 degrees and I go into the, in this case, that common rafter through there. And then I tap that with a hammer to cramp it all up, pull all the shoulders together. Especially here where I had a bit of a cup in the timber. Just give it a little tap. Now that is super solid. You can see the shoulder, even though it was a bit bowy and cuppy, you can see it's pretty straight. Back fix it up. Just got to run the jacks in now. If I'm doing a roof on the ground, I cut all my jack rafters by means of diminish. And I can work out the diminish for any degree of pitch. And basically how it works is, now these are just numbers, they may not mean nothing, but for a roof at 45 degrees, for every meter I travel level, so the run, for every meter I come in this way, there's a diagonal dimension. And for 45 degrees from memory, it's 1.4142. So if I'm working out a diminish, I'll divide that by 10, which is 1.4142, so it'd be 0.141. And I multiply that by the number of centers, in this case, four 100 centers, so I multiply that by four. So it gives me a measurement of around about 500 mil, 560 mil thereabouts. Now that is, believe it or not, from that common rafter length, if I come down that 560, that's the first cut, come down 560, that's the second cut, and those jacks will be exactly at 400 centers. And if you're at 600 centers, you divide the length 
per meter of run. So 1.4142 divided by six, divided by 10 times six. So, and that gives you the exact same. Um, so and if, if you were me, you would just get a tape measure and measure that. And the reason why I, I check them by tape is because I'm so anal that I love them to all meet perfectly. Mm. Whereas um, if, if you've got something, let's say this plate here, undulate slightly then it will affect the length you know and um, it's just and also it's just nice to check them off if, if the building's slightly out of square yeah. you can deal with that you can deal with it in the measure um, so but what I will do is I'll cut these and I'll make them the same I won't measure both sides I'll just okay. measure one side so I'm measuring to the plate 873 we'll call that write them on the plate as well I find if you write something down in life you don't forget it I'm not suggesting you remember all these measurements, but 390. But the, the biggest mistakes I personally make, let's say it's 873, I might cut it 837. Oh. Purely, it's like lack of concentration or dyslexia. Yeah. Bit of that as well. But, um, Numerical dyslexia. Yeah. The, the other thing I would do, if yeah. I, if I, the mistake I know I'd make, yeah. is when you're cutting this one, yeah. Is that to the short side or no? The it's side? always it's always to the long side. So when you saw me hanging my tape over there, yeah, centre to centre, measuring to four hundred. So it's that side, Outside and it's the that, that's the point, yeah. Okay. So when I'm down on the bench, I've got to make sure the bird's mouth is the right way around to mark that side, yeah. Mm. And there's a side I favour for the saw as well. So I always cut that side first and use the reverse cut for the other side. <laughs> So, these are going to be the jacks. We measured from the corner of the plate, so we do exactly the same there. We just mark that one. And the next one as well, 390. Reset the saw on the common rafter A run, 35, because this is the same as the rafters, same plum cut, same seat cut. And we mark a plum cut, simple as that. And there we have it. Now we're gonna break them out. I'll break this one out first. Now we're gonna see how we get on with this saw all the way through at 45. So incidentally, when you're cutting a jack, providing that your roof pitch is equal on both sides of the corner, and providing that the roof pitch is under 45 degrees, you always set your circular saw to 45. And that will always give you the right angle. Because if you think about it, if you're looking down on the roof, it's just a square corner. The hip passes through exactly in the middle at 45 degrees. And regardless of those rafters being up or down in any direction, that angle is still 45 degrees to the plumb cut. So if I hold the square, the angle is still 45 degrees to the plumb cut. So whether it's that pitch, that pitch. So you don't have to get any hand sawing done. It's all done with a circular saw. Didn't quite make it through there. Pretty close though. So there we have it. Well, that's the rafter here. Let's get another little piece there. And so you, that's your hip that passes through at 45. Now, put that to one side. <coughs> Let's break the next one out. Oh, tell you what, I reckon we've got a bit more on the depth for that. Let's give that a go. I reckon we're there. I say I've done it before and it was fine, so let's give that a go. Perfect. Look at that. Is that a nice jack cut or what? Or compound cut? We've got to cut a pair of jacks for the other side. It's really straightforward because we've got our cuts already and we just take the other rafters and we offer it on 
when you actually cut your compound and you flip it round, on the other end of the timber is, is the opposite side. So it's the side that will fit on the other side of the hip. So that's why I'll cut all one side out of full lengths and then I'll reverse the shortest with the uh, longest. Yeah, yeah, because it's already there. Exactly, yeah. So you get the top flush, point of the cut flush, and mark that. Same here with this one. Same there. You can see how accurate it is. That's because we've used a rafter template to do all the initial rafters. Every single one is exactly the same. That's a new technique just developed now, something I'm going to work up and use a bit more as well. So again, let's flick this back to 90 degrees where we need to be. Depth's good and we'll blast those out freehand now. Cut both those bird's beaks first. Some people say, why don't you use a jigsaw? But if anyone who, knows, who uses a jigsaw, unless you've got the Muffel jigsaw, the blades go all over the place. It's just, oh. So I'll just break these eave out now. Let's see if I can do them on here. When I say let's see if I can, obviously, when I'm doing a big roof, I set myself up slightly differently. So I'll have like three, a three-way support. So, because they let the ends drop, but this should be fine. Let's give it a go. I used to use 4 by 2 for everything. All rafters were 4 by 2 years ago. And now, because of insulation, everything's 6 by 2 or 7 by 2 8 by 2 even 9 by 2 sometimes. And actually, this is about the right size. I, I like to um, always use 6 by 2 where it's possible. So it gives you a really good clear span between a wall plate and a purlin, around about 3.1 metres. So it's very rare you have a raft of bigger than six metres, so you only need one mid-span support. And it, all, it deals with the insulation. Let's just hope they don't up those regs anymore and we have to use eight by two for the sake of it. But um, yeah, it's a nice size. It's a lovely size to work with. Get a decent bird's mouth. Just have to make sure the bricky knows to set the plate out to accommodate a big bird's mouth. Let's go fit those in. So when you're fixing the jacks, the smaller they get, what they have a tendency to do is as you fit them in, you've got to make sure that you keep the bottom level, so the eave level. So you can see, there's my mark, there's our compound cut, there's our bird's mouth. But what we want to do is make sure it's fixed nice and true and parallel, get it fixed over the plate, Fix it here, but don't fully fix it. Get a straight edge over those eaves from the hip to the last common rafter. Make sure that that is dead square and true. Sometimes they take a bit of support in until you get the fascia and soft fit on. Now I'm just going to take my long level. See, you can do this, a one man job. I'm just going to sit it on there, across the bottoms of the feet. And make sure when I fix it, I'm not going to look. Watch what happens if I pick it up too much, it's going to start going up and down, yeah? I'm just going to get it fixed perfectly there. And when you're fixing these, I've got 90 mil nail, what you don't want to do is come right through, so you want to sort of get the sweet spot on these, then you've got half the nail in the rafter and half the nail in the hip. And you want to be somewhere near 90 degrees to that. And I would say that you should always aim for in a 6 by 2 three nails. So I'll get one there. And I don't like to see them down the back either. Sometimes if the hip sags, it's best to straighten that hip sag out first by popping the leg under it before you put your rafters in. So you'll look up the hip, you'll prop that sag out of it because sometimes the timber will just bend under its own weight if it's six meters long. And then you do the center in this way. What you don't want to do is not prop that hip and then try and center it up because it might look straight, but when you put the other one in, you've got a big sag in it. So it's worth putting a prop under it, then centering it with your jacks, and then leave that prop there till you get your purlins in. And that'll be perfect then. Let's put this one in. So you see that these meet 
at 90 degrees. So we measured one side, but we've cut for both. I'm just going to take my tape and parallel that up. Not got a mark on the plate yet. Here we go, put a quick pencil mark on that. I'm happy with that then, he says. Hey. Oh well, that's perfect there. Same old trick with a level, cross the feet and the hip and give that a pull up. There we go, I'm happy there. There we go. Then we can just fix the rest of them. I'll talk to you about that hammer in a minute as well. Because you know what it is, don't you? Yes, the climbing hammer. Yeah, it's the California Framer. When I first got it, it was a bit like a comedy hammer. Because it was, well, I'm only small, aren't I? So it's like the length of my arm. But it's amazing once you get used to it. Okay. That's pucker. See how they meet on the on the hip. Obviously, if you've got two different pictures, that never works. And I had a job years ago, and someone said to me, "Well, they should meet." And I went, "No, because you've got 35 there, you've got 45 there." Oh, they said, "Oh." 400 centers. Tap that over. Lovely. Whack a little mark on that. Okay. That's your jacks. And what I also do. If you look at the distance between this jack and the hip, it's quite a big space there. So when I'm running my fascia through, I, I put all my cuts on for my fascia board. And when I'm running my fascia through, I actually put another jack in, but I put it in when I'm putting the fascia in. Okay. So I fix it through the fascia and then into the hip. You can do it before if you support it with a bit of 4 by 2 so you've got to take it off again. Yeah, so and there we go. I'm going to move on to the next bit of the roof now. I used to say to my apprentices, when you finish this, you'll be an ice cream man. They'd be like, what are you going on about? Uh -huh. So we used to call them the ice cream men until they was qualified. <laughs> 